Hey, we're just getting started. <sighs> huh, Chainsaw 3, huh? Uh, you really think this place will work? Oh yeah, this place will do. You mind getting the door, big guy? <laughs> Hey, look what your brother did to the door. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Hi there, I'm everyone's favorite killer clown turned horror host, Laugh Track Jack. You're probably wondering about the change in scenery. Well, the TV back at the farmhouse was a little out of date to watch Chainsaw 3. So, uh, we are currently in the home of some degenerate horror movie fan who graciously offered to let us use his TV. Unfortunately, on the way over here, the hitchhiker was suddenly struck by a semi-truck, which killed him instantly. So today, we'll be joined by his twin brother, who by coincidence was just now getting back home from his time served in Vietnam. I'm not sure why he's just now getting back home, though. I, I got lost on my way back. This plate that they put in my head, scrambling my brain. With that exposition dump out of the way, let's jump into the movie, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Turn back your clocks because we're going back in time once more. The year is 1989 and the slasher craze of the 80s has reached its end. This is the year films such as Halloween 5 and Jason Takes Manhattan bombed at the box office, proving that general audiences just weren't flocking to theaters to see teenagers get chopped up the way they had before. 1989 was also the year that New Line Cinema saw a significant decrease in numbers with the release of A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, compared to previous entries in the franchise, though it was still technically profitable. Unfortunately for New Line Cinema, this foreshadowing of what was to come went completely ignored, as their vision was obscured by the dollar signs in their eyes. The slasher craze of the 1980s was fun while it lasted, but all good things must come to an end. It was time to give the genre a much-needed and well-deserved rest. Good luck telling that to New Line Cinema, though, because they already had their eyes on their next cash cow. When New Line Cinema saw the opportunity to get their hands on the rights to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they wasted no time putting the next sequel together. In fact, they dropped a trailer for the movie before production began. Leatherface. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. They didn't even have a director yet. This time, all creative minds involved in crafting the first two films had been completely left out of the project. Why would they do this? Well, New Line Cinema wasn't looking for an artistic vision. They were looking to make the Texas Chainsaw Massacre into a full-on franchise, with the third installment paving the way for many more sequels to come. This wouldn't work out the way they had hoped, but we'll get into that later. The movie was written by David J. Show, or maybe that's Shao, and directed by Jeff Burr. New Line Cinema actually fired Jeff Burr at the beginning of production, but when they were unable to find literally anyone else willing to take the job, they called Jeff back in. I basically was like, uh, 
probably literally the 50th choice to do this movie. That new line said, legally cannot speak to Toby Hooper or Kim Hankel. We looked at the script and talked about what a mess the script was. The theatrical version of the movie made me look incompetent as a director. It was literally incoherent. And I wanted my name taken off the movie. And that's the last, the last words I said to Mike DeLuca. I want my name off the movie. Oh, what a shit show. Well, let's see how the final product turned out at the end of it all. The movie begins with an opening narration, which has become a tradition with each of these installments so far. And even though this movie calls itself the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, it does not continue from where Chainsaw 2 left off. Not that it would be very possible to continue the story with everyone you know... dead. The narration instead establishes the events from the original film, which uh, we kind of already knew. On August 18th, 1973, Sally Hardesty, her invalid brother Franklin, and their friends fell afoul of a bizarre cannibalistic plan of serial predators. Also, I really miss John Lyriquette. These other narrators just aren't doing it for me. So, this movie acknowledges the events from the original film, but not from Chainsaw 2? Where does that put this film on the timeline? Well, from what I've gathered, Chainsaw 3 was intended to be the real sequel to the original film. In fact, they wanted to bring Gunnar Hansen back on board as Leatherface. Unfortunately, this didn't happen, as New Line Cinema wasn't willing to pay the man what he deserved. First thing when I got the child, I go, man, this would really make it the true sequel by he had the original Leatherface back. He talked to me about being in the film. One of the main things was he needed uh, a certain monetary uh, commitment from New Line and that they weren't prepared to give. And it wasn't an outrageous thing he wanted. I mean, I was disappointed, but it just didn't work out. We will also learn very soon that this franchise has a problem when it comes to making direct sequels to the original film, something that is still done to this very day. It's as if these filmmakers believe that one of these attempts is going to be the one that strikes gold eventually. Okay, Hollywood, I have a pitch for the next Texas Chainsaw Massacre film. This time, we take the franchise back to its roots, you see. We make a direct sequel to the original film. I know this has been done at least four times in the franchise already, but this will be the one that works. This will be the true, 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 true sequel. Call me. This narration also continues the theme of Sally not getting a happy ending. In this version of events, she simply died in a private healthcare facility after a mere four years later. She died in a private healthcare facility in 1977. What the hell? How come these guys won't let Sally win? The narration continues to explain that there was a sole survivor of the Sawyer family named W.E. Sawyer who actually stood trial and was given the death sentence. A single member of the murderous family lived to see trial. The prosecution recorded his name as W.E. Sawyer. He died in the gas chamber in 1981. So wait, are they talking about the cook here? He was the only other family member present in the original film, so they have to be talking about him. They're saying his name is W.E.? I thought it was Drayton. I guess if we're ignoring part two, changing the name is fair game, but why change the first name and keep the last? The narration goes on to establish that the authorities assumed Leatherface was simply a persona belonging to W.E. Sawyer before suggesting that the real Leatherface is still out there. The jurors concluded that Leatherface, presumed to be an unapprehended killer, was in fact an alternate personality of Sawyer's. If there actually was a Leatherface, he remains at large. I'm not sure why they would doubt Sally's claims about Leatherface existing. That's just kinda odd, isn't it Leatherface? Hey, where's Leatherface? Uh, Le Leatherface? Who's Leatherface? Uh, I can invite W.E. over if you like the company. The narration concludes by saying the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was only the beginning. And the so-called Texas Chainsaw Massacre was only the beginning. beginning. Silly movie, this is part three, not the beginning. 
We get a nice montage of Leatherface doing his thing over the credit sequence, getting a few brief glimpses of this new version of Leatherface. Leatherface in this movie is portrayed by R.A. Mihailov, who brings a much more menacing version of Leatherface than previous incarnations of the character. This is completely by design as the creators wanted Leatherface to have grown from the innocent mindset of an adolescent into that of a rebellious teenager. The original script even included a new version of the Pretty Woman costume, which would have been complete with a large pink wig, short skirt, and leather jacket, though it did not end up in the final product. I'm relieved and yet somehow disappointed that we never got to see that. Well, they couldn't put it in the movie because I wouldn't lend Leatherface one of my wigs because he ruined my Sonny Bono wig. Uh, that was your wig? Uh, no. What's that? Nothing. I ain't got nothing. The montage continues, giving us a good look at Leatherface making one of his signature leather faces when suddenly a woman appears in the window. After Leatherface begins his pursuit of the woman, we cut to our main characters, Michelle and Ryan. They're on their way to California from Florida to deliver a car to Michelle's father. Michelle and Ryan's relationship doesn't seem to be on the best of terms. I mean, I wanted you on this trip so we could enjoy each other. We could talk. You mean talk or tiptoe around the real issue with chit chat? Now you sound exactly like my father. <laughs> Ryan and Michelle don't even fight in, like, a funny, entertaining way. It's just a strangely realistic depiction of a couple in an unhappy relationship. It's just kind of sad to watch. The couple shift conversation away from their collapsing relationship and begin talking about a newly discovered pit of dead bodies currently being reported on the radio. At least we're not as bad off as those people in that body pit. They were murdered. God, they had to have been. They didn't jump in with big grins and bathing suits. <laughs> what the hell? The way they both react nonchalantly about it cracks me up. It's such an odd choice to have a major plot point introduced in such a casual manner. Can you imagine in the original film if the gang overheard the grave robbings being reported on the radio and Franklin said, Well, they sure didn't dig themselves up with big grins on their faces. Followed by the characters being completely unfazed by the news entirely. Uh, I'm not a filmmaker. I don't make films. I make corpses out of the living. But if you want to hear a clown out, I think I know a better way to go about this scene. Instead of the oddly casual way it's done in the movie, here's my alternative version. You have the couple continue their pointless bickering until they overhear the morbid descriptions being reported on the radio. They both turn their attention to the radio in that moment. One of them slowly turns the volume up to hear it better. As they listen to the gruesome descriptions, an eerie, unsettling score starts to fade in, reminiscent of the original film score. Their once cold expressions toward one another gradually soften as they hear every last disturbing detail spoken. When they finish listening to the report, the couple sits there looking forward with pale faces, unnerved by what they just heard. Their bickering seems meaningless to both of them now. Maybe Ryan places a comforting hand over Michelle's or something like that to show the audience that they do care about each other deep down. With this version, you establish a dark tone while also humanizing your main characters. You know, the people you're supposed to root for throughout the course of the movie? It's especially important in the genre of horror to establish a connection with your characters so it makes it more impactful when something bad happens to them. Later that night, Michelle and Ryan coincidentally come across the pit of dead bodies as it is on their way to their destination. Men in biohazard suits dig through the bodies while taking pictures of the evidence, mirroring a similar sequence from the opening of the original film, though the sound effect back then was a lot cooler. Oh right, I almost forgot that we also get a brief cameo from Caroline Williams, aka Stretch from Part 2. Okay then. Thanks for that. We focus on a news reporter who struggles to pronounce a medical term, leading to Ryan mocking the man. A substance called adip... Uh, adip 
Uh, how to pause her, you idiot. You would know that, Mr. Pre-Med. Yeah, you would call him that, Miss Smooth Exposition. You would know that, Mr. Pre-Med. Oh, you gotta love when writers realize their characters lack any personality, so they give them these very natural scenes so they can dump out their previously hidden depth. Does it add anything to the character? Does it ever come back into the story at all? Nope. You would know that, Mr. Pre-Med. If you doubt what I'm saying here, check out how the scene progresses after that completely natural exchange. Creamy breakdown of body fat. You see, basically, if you're buried right, your skin turns into poison Crisco. I'm gonna get out of here. <laughs> She's just like, okay, we got that out of the way, now back to the movie, like nothing happened. It really is a shame that Michelle and Ryan weren't given much depth. And I think the reason why is simple. This movie has too many characters! Leatherface was given a lot more relatives this time around, including a daughter, each one being given a completely distinct personality and design. On top of them, the movie also introduces another protagonist who we haven't even met yet. It's pretty obvious that more effort was put into every other character in this movie over the main characters. We then get a rather hostile exchange between our two main characters and the sheriff. Coming from? L.A.? Going to. Land, Florida. Something wrong with the airlines? I've heard that the sheriff's hostility in this scene is a carryover from a version of the script in which he would be revealed as a secret Sawyer family member. The closest I've found to that claim is this alternative ending to the movie where the little Sawyer girl is riding in the back of his car. The sheriff sends them on their way, just move along, and keep moving. Allowing Michelle and Ryan to get back to their busy schedule of bickering with each other. Yeah, whoever did that's long gone. Sounded like the bodies were pretty decomposed too. You see, what happens is once we're buried Please, it... spare me the post-mortems. They just can't help but get these little jabs in at each other. Watching this movie is like being around the one couple in your friend group that's always fighting, so you just sit around awkwardly praying to God that they don't involve you. Looks like we're about here. Where? Middle of nowhere. They suddenly run over an armadillo. Poor little guy. <laughs> yeah, that was real manly. Let's play that clip back to back with another clip of Ryan from earlier. Violence is no answer to violence. Yeah, well, welcome to the real world, Michelle. You know, one of these days you're gonna have to live in it. <laughs> Ryan, you truly are a badass. Also, I just want to point something out. Michelle totally saw that armadillo. Think about it. They're on the wide open road, not another car in sight, broad daylight. She knew what she was doing. She targeted that armadillo. She got pleasure out of taking its life. Oh, but Jack, she looked away from the road. Yeah, for like a split second, it's not like she popped a corner and was caught off guard. That's probably why Ryan screamed in horror. This isn't the first time this has happened. To make things worse, she walks over to her victim of choice, taunting her prey. Sorry, little guy. That monster stands over the poor armadillo, choosing to prolong its suffering as she pretends to be unable to bring herself to finish the job. Ryan? Yeah, whenever there's nothing to talk about in these movies, I just kind of make stuff up. Not gonna stop doing it either. Ryan puts the armadillo out of its misery before we cut to a hitchhiker being dropped off at the Last Chance gas station. No, not that hitchhiker. This hitchhiker's name is Tex. Tex walks inside, walking past a man with a blind eye named Alfredo, who is casually cutting up pictures of Playboy models. Hey, that's something I used to do in my spare time too. Just not with pictures. In need of a fill-up, Michelle and Ryan pull into the same gas station. Ryan goes in to take a crap, leading way for Alfredo to approach Michelle as he does an awful impression of the hitchhiker from the original Chainsaw film. Hey, get it. Yeah, he got your kid. Five bucks. It's only five bucks. It's a good picture. What, what, what do you say? Three sixty nine. Okay, for just for you. Three sixty nine. Give it. Three sixty nine. The hitchhiker's craziness comes across as much more natural. Alfredo's is very forced in comparison. 
I never buy that this guy is a real-life crazy person. I have no trouble at all believing that the hitchhiker is. Alfredo continues harassing Michelle. Make the moan. Make the moan feel good. You don't like it. Mm -hmm. Before Tex intervenes, shutting him up. You ain't giving the lady a hard time now, are you? It doesn't take long for Tex to notice the blood on the front of Michelle's car. Wow, well, looks like you had yourself a little mess up here. And she tells him about how they hit the armadillo. We hit a little animal on the road. This interaction leads to a line that you know they just thought sounded so cool when they wrote it. There's roadkill all over Texas. And credits! Tex proceeds to flirt with Michelle, who doesn't seem to mind. Time. You're the last thing I saw before I died. I die a happy man. This movie has a great understanding of women. They love when you do that, especially right after being harassed by another creep. Ryan makes his way back to the car where Michelle openly flirts back with Tex in front of her current partner. I catch your eye as far as Ron's did. Mm. Sorry, Tex. We're on a pretty tight schedule today. Well, we could discuss it, I guess. But you see, I would normally give a character like Michelle crap for doing something like that. But both of these characters suck in their relationship, so I'll let it pass. I just wanted to take a moment to share this description of Ryan I found on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre fandom wiki. He is the self-centered boyfriend of Michelle, but he is good towards her. Why keep him menacing at times? He is mostly a good personality. I love how it says absolutely nothing about him being a pre-med. That just proves my point about how shoehorned in that character exposition was earlier. Also, why does this read like Michelle wrote it? This sounds more like her own personal opinion of Ryan than an explanation of his character. Now I'm curious about Michelle's character description. Michelle is a college student at the University of Los Angeles. Michelle, while en route to California with her boyfriend Ryan, why does this also sound like Michelle wrote it? Like her Facebook bio or something? I'm choosing to believe that Michelle wrote both of these, and that's why it comes across as completely biased. <laughs> Michelle excuses herself to the bathroom, leaving Tex and Ryan alone. Tex tells Ryan that there is a faster route to Florida than the one they're taking. Ryan doubts this claim at first, but Tex shows Ryan this new route on a map. I see. See? 1973. That road over there ought to be right there. Ain't even on this map. I'm sure there will be no dire consequences from following Tex's advice. Oh no, they'll be fine, don't you worry. <laughs> Meanwhile, it seems like Alfredo has decided to have himself a little peep show while Michelle uses the bathroom. While this movie doesn't depict any graphic sexual content, it is extremely perverted. We will get more into that later. Alfredo's peep show is cut short when Tex suddenly grabs him up and throws him outside. Alfredo doesn't take kindly to having his fun cut short, so he quickly retrieves a shotgun. Tex holds Alfredo off just long enough for Michelle and Ryan to escape, seemingly losing his life in the process. The cowboy! He shot the cowboy! What?! Oh yeah, I'm sure he's dead. He won't be back in the movie. Nope. It's not like the original film had the exact same twist with a concerned citizen at a gas station turning out to be a secret family member. Uh-uh, he won't be back. He's dead for real. If Tex shows back up at any point during this movie, I will literally shit my pants. Michelle and Ryan just barely escape before continuing their journey to Florida, deciding to take the route Tex suggested. Take the Cowboys route. What are you talking about? What route? Turn right! Go! 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 It's not like he would intentionally lead you to your doom or anything. You know what? The movie's over, in fact. They made it to their destination. They're fine. They lived happily ever after. And credits! Okay, I guess it's unrealistic to expect that happy of an ending. There does have to be a chainsaw massacre here, after all. 
Hey, speaking of which, have you ever noticed how in the original movie only one person gets killed with a chainsaw? Hell, in the second movie, nobody gets killed with a chainsaw. So much for a chainsaw massacre, this movie better raise those numbers! In fact, I'm going to introduce a chainsaw death counter for the remainder of this franchise so we can keep track of just how many people are killed by a chainsaw in these apparent chainsaw massacres. Right now, we are sitting at one. That being Franklin's death in the original movie. Michelle and Ryan drive late into the night, realizing that there's no town in sight. But there was a town around here. That's what he told me. Would you just slow down? Before long, they notice a large truck following them. The truck pulls up next to them when suddenly... Oh my god, Michelle! Again? How many innocent animals are you going to slaughter? We hit another one. No, it hit us. Okay, whatever you say, Michelle. It seems like Michelle and Ryan are in need of a tire change and they insist that they get it done as quickly as they can. Now we gotta change this tire and get out of here, now! Uh, Michelle, why is your trunk full of animal corpses? As they change the tire, their attention is turned to a strange squeaking sound coming from nearby, drawing closer and closer. Hear that? We soon see it is the metallic creaking of a man's leg brace, but not just any ordinary man. <laughs> leather man, I mean leather face. Since they were approaching Chainsaw 3 as the true sequel to the original film, I suppose it made sense to the filmmakers to acknowledge the leg injury Leatherface got at the end of the movie. It's just kind of weird to me that it's been like, what, 20 years since he got that injury? An injury that he pretty much recovered immediately from at the time. And he's still wearing a leg brace? Actually, even minor leg injuries can have long-lasting effects that a person may never fully recover from. At least the filmmakers put more effort into their work than you put into your upload schedule, clown. Damn. Right for the throat. Leatherface attacks the couple and they retreat into their car. Get in! It's locked! It's locked! As they struggle to get the car started, Leatherface starts cutting up the back of the vehicle. Uh, Leatherface, you do know they're in the front of the car, right? It wouldn't be that far of a walk if you simply walked up there and grabbed them out. If you stay at the back of the car, you leave yourself open to... They barely escape Leatherface, but not before he rips off the lid of their trunk. As they continue driving, Tex suddenly jumps out in front of their vehicle covered in blood, causing them to swerve in front of an oncoming vehicle, sending both vehicles off of the road. At least that's what they wanted to convey. In reality, the movie is edited in such a way that you never see both vehicles on the road at the same time at all. Maybe they had scheduling problems or something, I don't know. Both vehicles are totaled. Total. But miraculously, no one suffered any major injuries somehow. This is our introduction to... I'm Joe Grizzly, bitch! But in this movie, they call him Benny. But that won't stop me from calling him Joe Grizzly. Joe Grizzly makes his way to Michelle and Ryan to check on them. Ah! Take it easy! Take it easy! You're gonna be okay. While making sure they're okay, Ryan explains that they were attacked. There's some people after us. A guy with a chainsaw. There's a bunch of guys and they have guns too. Yeah, I know. And chainsaws. Militant lumberjacks. I see them all the time. I found my favorite character. So anyway, Joe Grizzly... Okay, I won't keep calling him that. Benny checks the couple for serious injuries and gives each of them a pill, insisting that they both take it. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I want you to take one of these. Okay. Go 
the water. Which they take without any hesitation. Hey, Jack, you should take this. Oh, great. What was that? Laxatives. Benny warns that the pills might make the couple a little sleepy. What did you give us? Painkillers. Might make you a little sleepy. Before going to his jeep to get more supplies, and sure enough, Michelle and Ryan are knocked out. On his way, Benny notices that someone has already lit road flares. He soon meets the one-handed man responsible for the job named Tinker. Looks like you had a little mishap. My jeep in this car, we had, a, we had an accident. I already know that. I need you to help me turn my jeep up. You mean upright? Right side up. Well, what do you think all these flares are for, stupid? Wow, Tinker's an asshole. Tinker tells Benny that he'll help get his Jeep turned up right, and while Benny is grateful at first, he soon notices something in the back of Tinker's truck. What's funny is that the chainsaw in the back of Tink's truck isn't even Leatherface's. Benny's just out here assuming. Just a second. I gotta get some. Benny runs to his jeep and starts prepping a big old gun. But Tinker charges Benny before he blows him away for the crime of... Owning a chainsaw. Benny is forced to take a dive down a hill in order to avoid being run over by Tinker. When he recovers, he comes face to face with Leatherface. Hey wait, wouldn't it be face to face, to face in this circumstance? Leatherface attacks Benny. And guess what? He still has his chainsaw! Which means that Benny was about to kill a man based off of an incorrect assumption. Good thing Tinker turned out to be one of the bad guys, because Benny was gonna blow him away either way. Benny holds his own against Leatherface while an unknown woman watches from afar. Leatherface eventually gets the upper hand, and Benny is moments away from meeting his doom. Fortunately for him, the unknown woman intervenes by getting Leatherface to chase her instead. Hey, scumbag! Here! You want me, not him! Leatherface sure is slow in this movie. I don't understand how his victims don't just escape him. Uh, Jack, we literally saw her escape him at the beginning of the movie. All right, point withdrawn. Maybe you notice these things if you'd stop talking and watch the movie with the rest of us. Hey, I don't have any say in this. You think this is what I want to be doing with my life? I used to be a notorious serial killer. I'm literally just doing my job. Michelle and Ryan begin to wake up. How long have we been out? Not knowing how long they've been out for. We gotta find the road. Or a house. Something. Well, I can't see anything going wrong with that idea. You go find that house, Michelle. I'm sure its occupants will be very friendly. The escaped woman that led Leatherface away soon meets back up with Benny. No, no, you go die. You made your choice. Leave me alone. Your sacrifice is appreciated. Michelle and Ryan journey through the woods while the girl explains to Benny that she is the only survivor of her group, having escaped from her captivity. They got us a week ago. I'm the only one left. Me and my sister. Sisters. So why hold her captive? Why not just kill her? Well, keep what I said about this movie being extremely perverted in the back of your minds, and it will all unfortunately make sense very soon. The girl tells Benny how she hasn't been able to get out of the woods because the Sawyer family watches the road, making escape nearly impossible, hunting down people who are unfortunate enough to enter the area and setting up traps all over the woods in order to catch them. They watched the road. 
They hunt people. They really hunt them. They trap them and they kill them. I must admit that's a pretty good strategy compared to what they were doing before. In the original film, the group of characters came across the farmhouse inadvertently. If Kirk hadn't walked inside, they would all probably still be alive. Benny decides that it's time for the Sawyer family to be hunted for a change. Why don't you stay here? Don't move. I'll be right back. He travels further into the woods with the intention of luring them out, intentionally triggering their traps. <laughs> and fortunately for Benny, he brought a gun to a chainsaw fight. Unfortunately, the girl Benny left behind is soon found by Leatherface, and she meets a gruesome fate. It probably would have been a better idea to keep her with you, Benny, considering you're actually armed. Our two main characters, as well as Benny, hear the girl's awful death from their positions in the woods. And I just love Benny's reaction to her death. Damn. And credits! Aren't you getting tired of that joke? Nope. It seems like Michelle and Ryan weren't very far away because Leatherface begins pursuing them, prompting them to run for their lives. Ryan is caught in a bear trap. Come on. So Michelle has to leave him behind. No, get out of here! <gasps> no, not Ryan! He might have been self-centered and menacing at times, but he was still mostly a good personality. Michelle runs as fast as she can until she eventually comes across a farmhouse. <coughs> Oh my god. I apologize. Oh, Jesus Christ. Michelle runs as fast as she can until she eventually comes upon a farmhouse. You know, one of those really inconspicuous ones. You know, with the giant spotlights out front? The ones with all the lights on inside the house so it looks really cool for the shot. Michelle makes her way inside, where I'm sure nothing bad will happen to her at all. Nah, she'll be fine. Michelle is lured upstairs by a crying little girl. Wait, wait. Trap. Michelle attempts to console the little girl who clings to her monster high doll. What's your name? This is Sal. But the little girl just immediately stabs her in the leg. Ah! 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 Don't talk. Kids. As Michelle backs up out of the room in complete shock, Tag suddenly pops up out of nowhere and grabs up Michelle, revealing to the audience that he was part of the Sawyer family all along. Uh. Well, they just get dumber. <laughs> Gasp. We then cut to Alfredo, who casually disposes of chopped up human remains. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how come these guys are throwing out prime meat? Aren't they cannibals? He even throws out somebody's head, with their face completely intact. I'm sure Leatherface appreciated that. And now that I'm thinking about it, a lot of the corpses shown in the body pit at the beginning of the movie were completely intact. If they're not cannibals, how come they're hunting people? If they are cannibals, how come they're wasting prime meat? Well, we see that Michelle has been taken downstairs and nailed down to a chair at the dinner table. I like Texas. You know, classic Texas chainsaw stuff. Why are you doing this? Yeah, I second that question. Why are you doing this? Well, the little girl seems to be able to offer an explanation. Because if you don't poke them, then they don't leak. And if they don't leak, we can't feed Grandpa. Silly. Oh, this is about feeding Grandpa. I get it now. Toby Hooper said that Grandpa is able to live as long as he does by drinking the blood of the youth. So this is actually in line with the original. <sighs> oh, 
Okay. We are then introduced to yet another new Sawyer family member, Mama Sawyer. Ruckus, ruckus, my nap is just a goner. The first living female Sawyer family member. Ha! Huh, funny. It seems like Mama Sawyer is looking for someone. Where's Junior? Mopping up, Mama. Who the hell is Junior? Wait, that's Junior? They changed Leatherface's name to... If he's Junior, who's Leatherface Senior? Boy, I sure hope they never change Leatherface's name again. Tinkerson arrives home walking in the door with Ryan's body, and Tex rushes over to help him set Ryan's body up on this fine contraption here, as Michelle is helpless to watch. <coughs> no, not Ryan again! He's only menacing at times! He's still mostly a good personality! Got some dark meat coming in too, Mama. If I had a dime for every time a New Line Cinema horror movie referred to a black character as Dark Meat, I'd have two dimes. How sweet. Dark Meat. Which isn't a lot, but it's still weird that it happened twice. Tex asks Tinker what he thinks about Michelle leading to this interaction. What do you think our little lady? She looks to me like she might go all screamy on us, Eddie. I wish you'd call me Tex. Eddie Sawyer is dead. That name no longer has any meaning for me. So anyway, as Eddie... Uh, sorry. As Tex checks on Ryan's body, he discovers that he is still alive, and in fact, mostly a good personality. I really don't let things go, do I? <laughs> Without much of an entrance, Leatherface just kinda pops up on Michelle, allowing for the audience to get our first up-close and personal look at Leatherface in this movie. There actually isn't much to discuss when it comes to this Leatherface's design, but to the costume's benefit, less is more. That isn't to say that there's nothing to talk about. I mentioned the leg brace earlier, and it does act as a cool carryover from the original film, acknowledging that Leatherface is flesh and blood and can take damage that being what separates him from characters like Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees. Leatherface is always grounded in reality. Put it down! Mostly. Mostly grounded in reality. This movie marks the first appearance of Leatherface with straight hair, contradicting his established curly hair in the original two films. I'm not complaining. I dig it. If you look closely, you can see that there is a small tattoo on Leatherface's mask, which is a cool little detail implying one of his victims simply had that before falling victim to the Sawyer family. You see, now I like that. That is cool. That took just a little bit more creativity than necessary, and I respect that. Leatherface has dropped the apron and suit jacket this time around, instead simply sporting a new button-up shirt and necktie each movie introducing a new rendition of both. Leatherface has a little bit more blood on him than usual, but I don't think it's overkill. <sighs> you wanna know what is overkill, though? A vital part of Leatherface that I haven't mentioned yet? Well, you're about to see. Jumping back into the movie here, we see that Leatherface has decided that he wants to share his music with Michelle, putting his headphones on her. Alright, play the clip. Leatherface is adorable, regardless of how horrifying he is. Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. Melvin, <coughs> Melvin, brother of the Joker. Melvin. <coughs> okay, remember that vital part of Leatherface that I left out earlier? Well, here you go. It looks like Tinker and Tex have gotten Leatherface a surprise. A solid gold chainsaw deemed the Excalibur, complete with an inscription on the bar which reads The Saw is Family, which is a nice little nod to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. The Saw is Family! 
All right, I'm torn here, because look at that thing. It's ridiculous. It is complete overkill. But at the same time, that thing is so cool. You like it, don't you? Oh, how far we have fallen from the realism of the original film. I guess that's Chainsaw 2's fault, though. At least in the Chainsaw sequels, the replacement for realism is fun. As Leatherface accepts his gift, Tinker comes in and starts nagging Leatherface for letting one of the victims get away. Well, it looks like you just got a present for a job you didn't finish. You lost a darkie, didn't you? Huh? Oh, right, um... Hey! Not cool! Leatherface offers Tinker his music as an apology, but he just shoves it in the oven to teach him a lesson. Well, you gotta learn. A running theme throughout these movies is Leatherface being bullied by his other family members. While he is menacing to everyone else, Leatherface is often submissive to his relatives. Or Leatherface takes charge this time around and makes Tinker grab it out of the flames. Damn, good for you, Leatherface. Leatherface is done taking everybody's shit. We catch up with Alfredo, who notices that a trap has been sprung, but there's no one caught in it. Trap sprung. He turns around to see a gun pointed in his face. Do I know you? That always ruins the mood. Benny tries to force Alfredo to tell him where the others are, but he doesn't seem very cooperative. How many? How many what, OJ? What? Stop cutting to me every time they say something racist! You know it's wrong! Do you really need a clown to tell you it's wrong? Damn! He sank right to the bottom just like John Marston! Back at the Sawyer house, Leatherface is playing a spelling game. Ah, classic scene! Displays a picture of a clown. F O O D. No, try again. Classic. We see that Benny has found the Sawyer home, and he has another classic Benny reaction. Kind of sick shit is this? I really like Benny. Leatherface joins the rest of his family in the kitchen, where they prepare to finish Ryan off. At the last second, the little girl runs in, begging them not to. No! Please don't! Not again! You promised! The next one was mine! Let me do it! Yeah, you, uh, you really had me fooled there, movie. For a second, I thought the kid had suddenly just, uh, swapped sides. The little girl sends the hammer down, bashing Ryan's head right in. Three. Uh -oh. <laughs> Putting an end to Ryan's life. Rest in peace, Ryan. He might have been menacing at times, it's true, but he was still mostly a good personality. Michelle mourns the loss of her lover as the Sawyer family goes on to taunt her. Here's when we get the way to spell on you. Remember what I said about this movie being perverted? You're probably wondering what on earth I was talking about. Well, here you go. Maybe we could let Junior play, son. He does make sweet damn babies, you know. Junior does what? He does make sweet damn babies, you know. Junior, uh, Junior does what now? He does make sweet damn babies, you know. No, don't play it again, babies, Jesus! You know? So, that's why the female victims were kept alive. So, that means the little girl is the outcome of... Oh. Junior likes them private parts. We knows what to do with them parts. You sick! Hedgie's loving leather fuck! You're going to hell, Leatherface. <laughs> Uh, writers inserting their personal fantasies aside, let's carry on. The family continues taunting Michelle, and Leatherface decides to do her makeup. 
Leatherface, you silly goose, that's not where lipstick goes. At the flip of a dime, Leatherface then starts up his chainsaw and starts closing in on Michelle. <laughs> Wait, I thought they were keeping her alive so Leatherface could make sweet babies with her. Uh, maybe it's a form of foreplay, I don't know. Just before the chainsaw reaches Michelle, Benny comes to save the day, shooting up the household and everyone in it. Mama! Mama! He even gets poor Grandpa. Mama! Rest in peace, Grandpa. Again. The chaos unfolding gives Michelle a chance to make her daring escape. <laughs> Go, Michelle! Go! The chase is on. The little girl runs upstairs to turn on the spotlights as Leatherface hops in his truck. Michelle continues running while Benny prepares to take the killer head on. Come on! He quickly aims his gun at the approaching truck, but with no bullets left to fire, Bunny. God damn it. He quickly aims his gun at the approaching truck, but with no bullets left to fire, Benny gets run over. No, not Benny! Leatherface stops his truck and continues his pursuit of Michelle on foot. Leatherface should have just continued pursuing her in his truck. It would have been a lot quicker. Hey, he couldn't have driven into the woods. All those trees are blocking his path. I guess you're right. Thank you for pointing that out before someone in the comment section could. Tags, having survived the gunfire, heads outside to help out Leatherface. That's when we see that Benny also survived. Armed with an axe, Benny begins fighting off the lunatic. Kick his ass, Benny. Why'd you leave us alone? You're hungry. Never heard of pizza. What a ridiculous suggestion. The Chainsaw family getting pizza. That would never happen. As Benny continues his brawl with Tex, he punctures a can of gasoline which slowly pours out over the duration of their fight. I'm sure this isn't setting up anything. Nah, they'll be fine. The fight continues, but Benny has had enough messing around. He pulls out a lighter and tosses it to the ground, setting Tex ablaze. <laughs> Benny gets out of dodge before the flames reach the truck, which soon erupts in a fiery explosion. And again, Benny's reaction to this is priceless. Son of Leatherface chases Michelle as she runs deeper into the woods when she's suddenly caught by one of the family's traps, pulling her into the water. The trap doesn't hold her underwater or anything, meaning she can simply just get out of the water, which makes me wonder what the point of that trap was. What? Aren't you going to explain how it actually makes sense and make a fool out of me? Uh, well, maybe the sound of water gives away their location. Foiled again. Leatherface soon catches up with Michelle, but Benny arrives just in the nick of time. I'ma cut that mask right off your face. He tackles Leatherface into the water where the two begin fighting. Leatherface's chainsaw protrudes from the water, the chain still spinning uncontrollably. I doubt that could happen, but okay. As the two fight, Michelle cheers Benny on from the sidelines. Yeah! You idiot, just leave! It's not like you're exactly helping anyway! Benny gets behind Leatherface and begins choking him out. It seems like Benny might just have the upper hand, but Leatherface pulls him off. Now it looks like Benny is in trouble, because Leatherface begins guiding him towards the running chainsaw. Well, I can't see this ending very well. Nah, it'll be fine. The struggle between Leatherface and Benny continues and... I guess now is as good of a time as any to point out that Leatherface's stunts in this movie are performed by Kane Hodder. 
famous for his portrayal of Jason Voorhees. Isn't that cool, Leatherface? Uh, sorry for that interruption. Leatherface pushes Benny closer and closer to the running chainsaw, and Michelle realizes that this might be a lost fight after all. Despite this, she still doesn't just leave. Leatherface maintains his advantage, and Benny soon meets his unfortunate demise, his head being forced into the chainsaw. Well, Michelle, you should have run away when you still had the chance. I told you. Leatherface turns his attention to Michelle and begins approaching his next target. He jumps out of the water and grabs her by the legs, attempting to pull her in. Like I said, coulda left, shoulda left. As Michelle is pulled into the water, she grabs onto a large rock that was sitting nearby. In a desperate attempt to defeat her attacker, she begins repeatedly bashing Leatherface over the head with the rock. While Michelle continues fighting off Leatherface, she begins chanting the phrase she said to the armadillo earlier in the film. Sorry. Guy. Sorry. Guy. Uh, poor guy, that looked like that hurt. She hits Leatherface over and over, chanting the phrase with each powerful hit, until he is finally defeated. His lifeless body slowly sinks under the water, as does his chainsaw. You see, this is actually quite artistic. Remember earlier in the movie when she couldn't bring herself to end the armadillo's suffering? What was she going to use? A rock. And now, at the end of the movie, as she's fighting for her life, what is she using? A rock. It's come back. The version of Michelle that we saw earlier wasn't willing to take a life, even if it meant ending the suffering of an innocent creature. Michelle had not yet been through the hero's journey. She was foolish, naive. Let us compare this to the person she later becomes. Look at the beautiful contrast in these scenes. One scene showing us a frightened girl in the light of day, the other presenting a brave woman in the dark of night. This is visual storytelling at its finest. The bright light of the day represents her optimistic perspective of the world and her innocence. The dark represents how she now sees the cruel cold world for what it is. Yeah, well, welcome to the real world, Michelle. You know, one of these days you're gonna have to live in it. Ah, the seeds were planted early on, but alas, we, the humble viewers, were oblivious. By the film's end, Michelle has a masterfully crafted character arc, no longer being the fearful victim who was too scared to even kill an armadillo. Michelle has been through a tremendous amount of growth as a character, having learned the very powerful and important lesson. Killing is good. The sun rises as Michelle journeys back to the road from which she came shaken up by everything she has been through. She sits on a nearby tire, exhausted. Just as she begins to relax, Alfredo's truck suddenly pulls up. Michelle thinks she's done for, but the truck door opens, revealing... I'm Joe Grizzly, bitch! Ha <laughs> He lives! He's back! How are you alive, though? Michelle is relieved that the family hasn't come back for her and thrilled to see Benny again. Benny helps Michelle into the truck before going around the other side to get in when he's suddenly struck by Alfredo, who had apparently been hiding in the back of the truck all along. Well, shit. Alfredo then attacks Michelle, leading to yet another struggle, though Michelle is able to get the upper hand this time when she pulls Benny's gun on him. I love Alfredo's reaction to this. I hate when this happens, you know. It's not even that great of a line. But the deadpan way he delivers it really sells it for me. My only complaint is that she doesn't just blow him away immediately after he says it. Instead, the two have a back and forth, leading to more quips and one-liners. Kills a chance for dinner Saturday night, huh? <laughs> I would have simply edited it like this. I hate when this happens, you know.
Thanks for better timing, I think. Michelle helps Benny get back in the truck before disposing of Alfredo's body. As she gets in the truck, she hits Benny with this epic zinger. There's roadkill all over Texas. Freaking epic, dude. Michelle and Benny ride off into the sunset, bringing their story to an end. But not before we get this sudden cliffhanger ending. And credits! For real! Wow, what an ending! Leatherface is alive, you guys! I sure am excited for the next installment! I really want to know where this franchise goes next! <laughs> what? What's that? Yeah. They don't continue from this one! Yeah. Then what comes next? Oh... Oh no... Well, you're probably wondering what my final thoughts are on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. And all joking aside, I know I tore into this movie quite a bit, but I actually have a soft spot for this movie. While I don't enjoy it as much as the first or the second, I still think it's a pretty good one. It's not great, but it's not horribly offensive. It has plenty of good things to offer, such as fun new family members to act alongside Leatherface. Arguably too many family members, but I digress. I appreciate that they made each family member have a unique personality as well as making them visually unique. Mama Sawyer didn't have to be in a wheelchair with a speech box in her throat, but it's cool that she did. Tinker didn't have to have a metal hand and a resentment of flesh, but it's neat that he did. The flesh! It was steel! The same goes for the other family members, too. Even Leatherface differentiates from other portrayals with his leg brace. I think this movie brought us a really cool version of Leatherface. Sure, he's not as sympathetic as he was before, but I think there's enough of that childlike innocence in there. Some would argue he's too similar to Jason Voorhees in this movie, given his more brutish demeanor, but I don't know if I agree with that. I think this version is fairly in tune with his established character, just with a little bit more edge. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 is far from perfect, but it's a fun watch. It's the most like a generic slasher out of the original three movies, but that's not always such a bad thing. I'll take generic over boring any day. All in all, this movie is fine. Nothing grand, nothing terrible, just fine. Though New Line planned on using the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 as a base for a franchise, this never came to be. This direction for the franchise would be immediately abandoned in the following movie. Now what kind of crap is that? New Line Cinema hired these guys to start up a whole new franchise for them, and they immediately threw it out. Well, if they're not going to finish what they started, then neither am I. I'm not reviewing the next movie. Hey, where are you going? I thought we were going to talk about the rest of the franchise. Whatever, you're on your own. Why, I never. Who does this clown think he is? We had a deal. Come on, Bubba, we're not letting him get away that easy. <laughs>